On the central plateau of Mexico, there stand many stately monuments to the advanced nature of its ancient civilization. This is the towering Pyramid of the Sun, one of the world's largest pyramids. Quetzalcoatl, the plumed serpent, was the great Taltec teacher. Under Quetzalcoatl and his subordinates, these civilizations were far advanced in art, surgery, and astronomy. The 12-foot calendar stone of the Aztecs was as accurate as calendars of today. Across this ancient culture, the Spaniards, bearing the cross, but more effectively the cannon, forced their way in the 16th century, a conquest symbolized by this Spanish-type building erected on a ruined pyramid. Today, the paved roads of the Spanish invaders remain, and bridges centuries old but usable aqueducts for carrying the precious water. Today, three types make up Mexico's population. This man is of pure Spanish ancestry. For 300 years, the Spanish ruled Mexico. This man is a mestizo, a mixture of Spanish and native Indian blood. The third division of the population is of pure Indian stock. Of central importance in Mexico's story is the hacienda, or large land holding, into which the country was divided after the Spanish conquest. The landlords lived on one side, and on another side of the huge hacienda enclosure lived the Indian natives and mestizos who worked the lands for a share of the crop. In the big house lived the owner and his family. Close by was the chapel, where religious services were held. Daily, the workers labored in the broad fields, vast tracts which often included thousands of acres. However, in 1917, in the Chamber of Deputies, Mexico began to return some of the land to the farming people. Many of the huge holdings were divided. The Indian and the mestizo, who had long toiled for others, now had their own land to till and to receive from it the full reward of their labors. The huge plantations of the maguey plant, from which the popular native drink pulque is made, are reminiscent of the old hacienda system. Here we see one of a large number of workers approaching with his donkey to gather sap from the plants. In the center of the huge cactus-like arms of the maguey plant, the sap oozes out into a basin. The long gourd with one end open and a hole in the other provides an implement by which the worker draws up the sap. When the supply has been taken from the plant, it is carried over and emptied into one of the casks strapped to the back of the donkey. Many workers, even today, are employed on these large land holdings. The pride in possession of their own lands, however, is reflected in the home life of the workers. This mestizo housewife is drawing water for the evening meal. The typical adobe house construction is in evidence. A bed mat of coarsely woven grass stands by the door. While grandmother watches over baby, she does fine hand needlework. She uses the sewing machine only for coarser work, on clothing, for example. The evening meal will be much like others. Cakes or tortillas from cornmeal, ground as needed, will form a principal part. The Mexican housewife may spend as much as six hours daily grinding meal from corn on the metate or grinding stone, the most important article of furniture in every rural household. Now, as the first wet corn meal is being ground to the proper consistency, the cooking fire is lighted. Baby's swinging cradle keeps him amused 
and off the earthen floor. Each handful of corn grains is first ground into coarse meal and finer on each regrinding. This household skill is a required part of the education of the Mexican girl, even as the tortilla or flat corn cake is a leading part of the diet of the typical Mexican family. Aside from the grinding stone and stove, the living and dining room presents few articles of furniture. The men folks spend their days in the open air working, so plain fare and simple furniture fit well into their scheme of life. Tortillas and beans called frijoles are nourishing and inexpensive. The thin tortilla can be folded easily about the frijoles, or a piece of it can be used as a spoon with which the beans may be scooped up. Baby can wait for his supper until his elders have finished. The typical day in the Mexican working man's home ends with the familiar strum of guitar and the melodious folk song. fiestas come regularly and often to the people of Mexico. Decoration of the village church indicates this celebration may be partly in honor of some local saint. The general feeling, however, is one of joyous abandon with dancing and festival gaiety. This official is setting off a handmade skyrocket as a signal for the beginning of festivities. There apparently is no great hurry, however, for this man is leisurely finishing the decoration of his oxen. A donkey's headdress reflects the spirit of festivity, which again is seen in the faces of the riders. And now from all parts of the village, residents and visitors begin to throng toward the central public square. Fiesta costumes are evident everywhere among the marchers, in their dresses, hats, and other ornaments. Visitors from neighboring towns have swelled the village population from hundreds into thousands. Of the many fiesta dances, the dance of the conquest is most reminiscent of Mexico's rich history. Strongest men dress as native Indians. The children of the village dress as Spaniards. Thus, in gay fiesta time, in their folk dances, the people of Mexico relive the stirring events in their history.